everyone. So we are going to talk about uh, altitude training. So first, I would like to ask you a question. How many of you are coaching? Can you, yes? And how many of you are using some type of altitude training, including an hypoxic tent or taking your athletes to the, to the mountain? Okay, not so I have to convince a lot of you that it works. <laughs> My uh, talk is about the current evidence uh, of the effectiveness of altitude training in elite endurance athletes. Probably uh, you know the most uh, historical method, that is leave high, train high, that has been developed in the 60s for the Mexico Olympic Games. It's very simple, you take your athletes for three or four weeks to a moderate altitude, and we have a lot of different uh, training facilities around the world. You have here Saint Moritz. Saint Moritz is a Swiss ski resort, and for example, the USA track and field team has been to Saint Moritz before the London uh, World Championship last summer under the supervision of uh, Dr. Randy Wilber and Rob Chapman. So they've been very successful, but obviously it's not enough to convince you that altitude training is e effective. We need scientific evidence. Then later on, starting uh, very early in the ex-Soviet uh, countries for military reason, but starting a bit later in the 90s or early 2000s with the development of uh, hypoxic facilities, you'll get a second big family that is leave low, train high. So you will use either a mask system that will be for passive exposure, intermittent hypoxic exposure, or you can use like this type of facilities that, that are everywhere in the world, hypoxic chambers where you can bike, uh, run on a treadmill, and so on. In the 90s, Professor Ben Levine and uh, his colleague uh, Stray, uh, Jim Stray-Gunderson, they have uh, published a paper that has really changed the way the athletes were training. It is called Leave High, Train Low. And you can then take your athletes, they will sleep in altitude and use a lower altitude for training. You can do it with terrestrial method. You take your car or your cable car to train lower. Or you can use like simulated altitude, either with nitrogen dilution or oxygen filter filtration. Just be sure that you understand that leave high, train high, and this type of simulated altitude are two different types of hypoxic stimulus. Here, you'll have 20.93% of oxygen. Even at the, at the top of the Mount Everest, you have the same oxygen concentration than here. What makes difficult to use oxygen, what makes more difficult the oxygen delivery, is that you have a decrease in the barometric pressure. So the inspired pressure of oxygen is decreased in hypobaric hypoxia, I mean real altitude, because of the decrease of the barometric pressure, while in simulated altitude, very often, in most of the training facilities now around the world, you have a decrease in the oxygen concentration, in the oxygen fraction, and no change in the barometric pressure. So here you have hypobaric hypoxia, and here you have normobaric hypoxia. But you can perfectly match the oxygen pressure between the two conditions. It is possible to match the oxygen pressure, but it's impossible to match both oxygen pressure and nit nitrogen pressure. We will discuss if it has some uh, consequence in terms of the athlete's preparation. So in 2007, Randy Wilber published a book, and at that time, you had these three big families, leave high, train high, leave high, train low, leave low, train high. Then we uh, speculated that it could be beneficial to combine for example here, leave high, train low and high. You will sleep high, train low, and from time to time, train high. And instead of having only passive exposure and uh, IHT, that is uh, interval training and hypoxia, we've also developed new training method in this leave low, train high family. That is continuous hypoxic training, low intensity, 
continuous training. So you will go to the chamber for one hour at 60% of your PPO, for example. And a new method that is repeated sprint training in hypoxia, RSH. And later on, I will explain how it could benefit to the preparation of the triathlete to combine leave high, train high, leave high, train low, and these new training methods. So finally, the picture of the panorama of the, all the hypoxic training method now, it's a bit more complex than it was only a few years ago. You still have leave high, train high, leave high, train low, leave low, train high. Uh, you can see that you can induce hypoxia at the peripheral level either by using systemic hypoxia, so decreasing the oxygen pressure, or by using some other type of mechanism like blood flow restriction or pre uh, ischemic preconditioning. At the end, at the muscle level, you will get a deoxygenation. You will get some similar mechanisms than if you are in altitude. So if I uh, dare speak about my personal journey, uh, as it was mentioned, I, I, I have had a, uh, in a previous life some uh, experience as a coach with different countries, and we've been using for very long all these uh, training methods. So we've been, to, uh, we've been to Kunming in China, we've been to Kenya, we've been uh, with different teams everywhere, and a lot of the investigation that I'm running now as a scientist are more or less based on some concerns I had when I was a coach 20 years ago. So there's a, there's a direct translation of what we are doing as a scientist to the field, and then I hope it will also help you. So first point, is it exactly the same to use real or simulated altitude? Then I will speak about the potential risk to use altitude training. Is it risky in terms of the health of your athletes or simply is it detrimental in terms of, your, of the aerobic performance? Then I will ask a very important question, the most important question for you, does it work? Is it effective to take elite endurance athletes who have already a very high VO2 max, who have already a very high total hemoglobin mass to altitude, or did they already reach some limit? And then there's no point to take them to, to use hypoxic method. And later on, I will introduce some recommendation about how you could optimize the monitoring of training, recovery, sleep, when you take your athletes to altitude and present the RSH method. So that's the content of my talk. So first of all, is it exactly the same? For long, remember altitude training start in the 60s, for long, all the physiologists around the world were looking only to one single and simple mechanisms, improving oxygen transport capacity. But if you look to the literature, it seems a little bit, a little bit more complicated. If you believe that only oxygen pressure induces the potential beneficial or detrimental adaptation, then you believe in what has been called the air altitude equivalent model. Only oxygen pressure is important. Then, if it is the case, there's no difference between hypobaric and normobaric hypoxia because you, you can perfectly match oxygen pressure. But by looking to the literature, it seems that simulated altitude or real altitude are not exactly the same. For example, I will um, overview very quickly the main mechanisms. In the literature, there ha we have already some differences in the ventilatory responses. We have differences in the fluid balance. It has been shown that if you pre-acclimatize your athletes in real altitude, in hypobaric hypoxia, the pre-acclimatization will be more effective than if you pre-acclimatize your athletes sleeping in an hypoxic chamber, in normal baric hypoxia. Already some uh, difference have been shown in terms of the oxidative stress that is a very important parameter when you manipulate oxygen fraction. You've got some differences in the nitric oxide metabolisms. That means potentially also in the hemodynamic responses. You've got differences in the sleep quality. You've got differences in the heart rate. 
and potentially on the basis of a meta-analysis by Bonetti and Hopkins, it has been speculated that it could induce also some difference in terms of the uh, performance gain, performance enhancement. You see, this air altitude equivalent model is probably uh, very important. There's no doubt that oxygen pressure and the stimulation of the erythrop erythropoietic responses is a key mechanism. There are already some other mechanisms that will influence your adaptation. So important question, what are the risks? Is it a problem to take your athletes to altitude? So I have listed different type of risk. The most uh, obvious is acute mountain sickness. Then muscle wasting, sleep quality and recovery, infection, do you increase the, inf the infection risk when you have the athletes at altitude? And finally, a key point, anemia. Is it beneficial to take your athletes in altitude when they are anemic? I run, uh, I run uh, how do you say that, uh, deprived. So the first point, acute mountain sickness. First of all, you can see that the prevalence is quite low at the altitude that are used for ergogenic effect. We will never recommend to take athletes above 3,000 meters. So the prevalence is low. Secondly, the symptoms, it's not that dangerous. It's only headache, loss of appetite, dizziness. It starts after four to eight hours, so generally during the first night. And of practical interest, after two to three days, you have a complete remission. So for the worst, of the case, you might have up to 20% of your athletes who will sleep not so well during the first night if you sleep between 2,000 and 3,000 meters of altitude. There is no risk that they will develop uh, cerebral edema or pulmonary, pulmonary edema at that altitude. It has to be much higher. Second point, muscle wasting. You know, it's a very um, simple mechanism. Since you have less oxygen in your blood, to improve the diffusion to the muscle, if you stay long at altitude, you will have a reduction in your muscle volume. And this reduction is shown here. You have the hypoxic dose, how long you stay at altitude, and you have the decrease in the cross-section area. That means the muscle volume in the quadriceps. What we see here is that this muscle wasting starts with 5,000 of kilometer per hour. 5,000 of kilometer per hour, it means 5,000 5, hours at an altitude of 1,000 meter, or 2,500 meter uh, hours at an altitude of 2,000 meter. So that means that to get a potential muscle wasting, you would have to spend more than 100 days at an altitude of 2,000 meters. Again, it is not what we recommend. We will never recommend you spend so long in altitude. So the risk of muscle wasting, we can forget it. Then you've got the sleep quality. Here, there's a, a slide from one of our study where you get the saturation, sleep saturation, and we compare sleeping in an hypoxic chamber, normal baric hypoxia, and sleeping in real altitude. The ambient oxygen pressure was much, but you can see that you will desaturate to a larger extent in real altitude. And you can see also here that this index, that the number of time you desaturate that more by than 3%, it is a uh, uh, marker of uh, periodic, brief, uh, periodic sleeping, this index is higher in real altitude than in simulated altitude. So it is true that sleep quality will be deteriorated when you sleep at altitude, but it will be more deteriorated when you sleep in real altitude than in simulated altitude. Everything comes from the different breathing pattern. Uh, the, pat the, the way you breathe is different in simulated and real altitude. Next point is iron supplementation or iron deficiency. It is a study from the, the team of uh, Chris Gore at the Australian Institute of Sport. They've checked what would happen when you have people who could be 
with a low ferritin or people who have a high ferritin and they will take high dose or a low dose of ferritin. Then from that, you can see that even the one who has before the training camp quite a low ferritin level, if you supplement them with a dose that is large enough, you will induce a large increase in your hemoglobin mass. So for example here, you know, they took 200 milligrams of iron per day, and at the end, you can see they had a 4% increase in the hemoglobin mass. If you have no supplementation, does not matter if you have a high initial level of ferritin or a low uh, level, you will have a minimum increase in your hemoglobin mass. And if you have a low ferritin level before, but you take a lower supplementation, then you will get a lower increase in hemoglobin mass. To make it short, whatever the level of ferritin you have before an altitude training camp, you have to supplement the athletes with iron. And if the supplementation is high enough, then it will make possible that you have the increase in hemoglobin mass. So if I summarize about the risk, acute mountain sickness, there's no risk. Muscle wasting, there's no risk. Sleep quality, yes, it is a problem, but it is a problem uh, in real altitude, less in hypoxic chambers. Anemia is a problem, but that needs a very early and large supplementation. Then you can see that I didn't speak about infection because the key issue in altitude is that you have a real increase in your uh, upper respiratory tract infection. You have a larger increase to get sick, and obviously it is not something uh, beneficial in terms of preparation and uh, performance enhancement. And then here, there is no real solution. It is recommended to not use antioxidant during the acclimatization phase, so you can not not use massive dose of uh, vitamin C, for example, because it will blunt the ventilatory acclimatization. It is simply to get a very good uh, medical uh, staff to survey, to check the athletes, and uh, to make sure they don't get sick during the first few days at altitude. So the other key question is, uh, does it work for elite endurance athletes? So you have to remember that uh, when you go to altitude, you have to define the level of altitude. Is it too high, is it too low, and the duration. In terms of the level of altitude, going to this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, here you have the relationship between the arterial pressure and the arterial saturation. That's 100 millimeter of mercury in the arterial uh, blood. That's uh, about that's the lung level. And here, at the muscle level. You can see it's not a linear relationship. From that, if you get in this portion, above 60 millimeter of mercury, a decrease in your arterial pressure, maybe because you have some pulmonary disease or simply because you are at altitude, has a very small impact on your saturation. But when you go to the steeper part of the curve, a decrease in your arterial pressure induces a large decrease in saturation. And this level of 60 millimeter of mercury corresponds to the altitude of 2,500 meters. But in addition, you know that when you exercise, and it's even more true in elite endurance athletes, you have a desaturation, including at sea level. About 50% of the top winter ski uh, elite uh, athletes are hypoxemic, exercise in due hypoxemic. That means even in normoxia, at high intensity, they have a large decrease in their saturation. That makes that, if I take into account the desaturation that is due to the altitude and the desaturation that is due by, to the exercise, we know that the perfect altitude range to do leave high, train high, is between 2,200 and 2,500. But when you look to all the different training facilities around the world, you have a lot of them that are too low. Most of them, like uh, Colorado Spring, Kunming, the Chinese one, Fon Romeu, the French one, Saint Moritz, the Swiss one, are too low. Most of them have been developed too early, and we didn't have the knowledge at that time. So if I take the range 
above 2,200, and you, you have to go either to go to, you have to choose either you go to East Africa, like uh, Aiten, or you go to the Rocky Mountains, that is a good option for you. Or in Europe, you have only one training facility, that is uh, Sierra Nevada, the Spanish one, that is at the perfect altitude level. But in addition now, for uh, the sake of uh, combining different altitude methods, you get, like Font Romeu, the French one, 1850, but they've just established an altitude chamber at Font Romeu because they want to be able to do leave high, train high, and for example, repeated sprint in hypoxia. You've got Sierra Nevada, it's 2,300, but you can train lower, you can train higher, you can combine the altitude and the different method. And that's the expertise now in terms of altitude training is not using only one single method, leave high, train high, leave high, train low, RSH is about the combination. You can see that uh, it would be uh, not uh, possible to convince Fonremo just 10 years ago that they need an, uh, an hypoxic chamber in Fonremo. It was only for leave high, train high. Now you've got all these different possibilities. Then the mechanisms for elite endurance athletes, they need a high oxygen transport capacity. It's a very simple one, at least on a, on a paper world. You've got a decrease in your inspired oxygen pressure, decrease in the arterial pressure, then you will stimulate the expression of the IF1 alpha, stimulate the production of EPO in the kidney, that will induce the erythropoiesis, increased level of erythrocyte, then total hemoglobin mass. There is a strong relationship between hemoglobin mass and VO2 max, and we know that VO2 max is a very important, not the only one, but a very important parameter for aerobic performance. But in the same time, you know, there are several and a lot of different side effects that we are uh, looking for. Then looking to the increase on, of hemoglobin mass, it is very simple, it's a slide from Levin. The longer you stay at altitude, as long as you are in the right range of altitude, the larger the increase in hemoglobin mass. Let's say three weeks at an altitude of 2,200 will induce, on average, three to 4% increase in hemoglobin mass. One more week will increase a bit more your aerobic uh, capacity. The only way you can measure the total hemoglobin mass is by using the CO rebreathing method. That is, here you will inhale a little bit, a little amount of uh, carbon monoxide, that is a poison, and by um, calculating uh, the, the carbon uh, monoxide is, uh, has a very strong affinity with hemoglobin. Then it will bind to hemoglobin and then uh, you have to do a bit of calculation. You can calculate the total hemoglobin mass. It is very important because the total hemoglobin mass, that is not the hemoglobin concentration, the total hemoglobin mass is very strongly related to your VO2 max. The top athletes, they can have up to 1.5 kilo of hemoglobin in their body, like cross-country skiers, while, you see, top athletes, they will get up to 17 gram per deciliter. But the relationship is quite poor between concentration of hemoglobin and VO2 max, while it is very, very good between total hemoglobin mass and VO2 max. But you need the zero breathing method. Then the relationship is here. Time to, ex time to exposure or exposure duration to hypoxia, increase in hemoglobin mass. You can see there's a linear relationship for most of the studies. And on average, it is 1% increase for every 100 hours you spend in altitude. Very simple way to remember that. 100 hours at altitude, 1% increase. But in the same time, you might have some a study that are biased. It's very surprising that with 200 hours of exposure, you get an 8 to 10% increase of total hemoglobin mass. Or maybe there is some blood doping, but that's not the case here. So it's completely out of the curve. Then here, the same. If 
I express the hypoxic dose not only in hour, but in kilometer per hour, taking into account also the altitude level, then you get the, this relationship. And again, you get some Bayes study. To answer this question, does it work for elite endurance athletes? We just have to observe. It's not scientific, but I've been, uh, I've, I was here yesterday and uh, we, we had some nice lecture about being critical, uh, uh, observing the athletes. So you see all these top guns in their respective sports. The Brumley, that's Samoritz, I guess. And they have also a, a, a hypoxic chamber. Uh, I'm working with Romain Bardet in Sierra Nevada, uh, Froome on the Tade. You've got uh, Martin Fourcade, the best biathlete in the world. Paula Radcliffe, she spent most of her life between Albuquerque and uh, Fon Rameau. You've got Mo Farah. You've got um, the Kenyan, obviously, in Aiden. You've got, uh, I was two weeks ago in, uh, in Netherlands, the Dutch ice skating, they are taking all the medals, they use also some type of altitude training. So my question is, do you know any world level endurance athletes who don't use any type of altitude training? Personally, I don't know any of them because I know also that some of them, they have their own uh, hypoxic chamber. So maybe, probably, they have, uh, there are a lot of uh, top guns who don't use altitude training, and swimming might be a bit different, but running, triathlon, um, cycling, now they all use more or less altitude training. Does not mean they use it in the final preparation. For example, the Dutch ice skater, they don't use it for the tapering, they're just using it for the base training. Many, many options. You know, the toolbox is very large, and you, can, you have to play with all the different possibilities. Then, we had a study from uh, some colleague from uh, Denmark. They published a study that was uh, stating that if you have a high hemoglobin mass, then you don't benefit from altitude training. Here, you get an inverse relationship, baseline hemoglobin mass, increase in hemoglobin mass on the y-axis. So the lower the initial level, the larger the increase. That would mean, if I believe this study, that would mean that there is no need to take my top athletes in triathlon, for example, because for sure they are here. For sure they have above 14 or 15 grams per kilo of hemoglobin mass. They would not benefit. The problem is that three of these studies have been based. It's been criticized not by myself, it's been criticized by, two have been criticized by Jon Verling, head physiologist at the Swiss Institute, and one has been criticized by Chris Gore, head physiologist at the Australian Institute of Sports, people who work on a daily basis with endurance athletes. And if I take into account the relationship between uh, exposure duration and increase in hemoglobin mass, with the nine studies, there is no relationship, surprise, if I take out the three BA study, there is this relationship. Then we've been challenging this data, and we just published a study with Rob Chapman and my team. Rob Chapman is the head physiologist of USA Track and Field, very uh, knowledgeable uh, scientist in uh, altitude training. And then we took into account 15 studies using CO rebreathing, so the more accurate uh, method. And you see that you have this relationship and you have the three BS to D that are here, one, two, three. So the relationship between hypoxic dose and increase in hemoglobin mass is there. If I check the relationship between initial level and change in hemoglobin mass, you can easily observe that even the athletes who have a high level of hemoglobin mass can increase their hemoglobin mass, total hemoglobin mass level by three to four percent. That means that it's still valuable to take your athletes even if they have above 75 or 80 of VO2 max, even if they have above 14 or 15 gram per kilo of hemoglobin mass. That has just been published in British Journal. And then we, we did another study where we did investigate exactly the same, but taking into account endurance athletes and team sports athletes. So you can get the relationship, no relationship at all between initial level and increase in hemoglobin mass. But here you had this relationship expressing gram per kilo. This relationship is simply explained by the change in body weight. 
The change in body weight, and you know that altitude has an anorexic effect. It's likely that your body weight will decrease. Change in body weight will explain the uh, relationship between change in total hemoglobin mass and initial level of uh, total of hemoglobin mass expressed in, in gram per kilo. Uh, to make it short, we believe that uh, it's still very valuable to take your athletes, and it is supported by all the uh, scientists, uh, most of the scientists in the world who work on a daily basis with elite endurance athletes, and it is supported by uh, the current practice at the elite level in uh, almost all the endurance sports. So now uh, let's speak about how you could improve the way you monitor acclimatization and fatigue with your athletes. Coming back to the initial study of Ben Levin, probably you've seen this slide uh, many times. You know, they had three groups. They train for four weeks. One group trained and slept at low altitude at uh, around 1,200 meters, that's the group low, low. Two groups slept at, uh, around 2,500 meters. One group train high, sleep high, train high. One group sleep high, train low. The two groups who slept in altitude improved their VO2 max. And in terms of the translation to the field, the group who slept high but trained low, you have it here, after Few, few weeks after the training camp had a larger improvement in terms of performance. They had a larger uh, decrease over time. Uh, they have a larger decrease in time over a 5K or 5K running. So this study has completely changed the way uh, most of the athletes train, and the leave high train low method has been seen as a gold standard method. But my point is about the a possibility that you would benefit from altitude training or you would not. If you improve your performance, then you can be called you are a responder. You respond positively to altitude. If you don't, you're a non-responder. Here you have in black the responders and in white the non-responders. What can we observe? It seems that the responder, they had a lower decrease in their velocity during interval training. They had a lower VO2 during interval training. To make it short, it's very important to observe the behavior of your athletes. P uh, the athlete who will suffer to a large extent about altitude training, who will complain that they don't feel good, uh, had a bad mood, they are more likely to, to be uh, non-responder to altitude training. So that's the first point and probably the most important one. Observe your athletes and check their feeling, check their behavior. So you had all the uh, training content, and then you had the physiological response that would explain at the end positive response or non-positive response. So during the acclimatization phase, the first few days, five days, seven days, up to 10 days, if you have no experience of altitude, it's possible. The acclimatization phase is absolutely key. If you are not accurate in terms of Dehydration, desaturation, infection, intensity of training, sleep quality, fatigue level, and ventilatory acclimatization during these first few days at altitude, you have no chance that the athlete will benefit uh, to the um, altitude training camp, from the altitude training camp. So few solution. Dehydration is very important. You have a large risk to be dehydrated because you will hyper hyperventilate. And since you hyperventilate, you will release a lot of CO2 that will change your acid-base balance in, the, in your blood and you will then remove your bicarbonate by the urine. So you will have a, a, a lot of uh, fluid loss by the ventilation and a lot of fluid loss by the urine. Then the risk to be dehydrated is very high. Then you need to monitor dehydration by using urine-specific gravity, by using bioimpedance, simply by monitoring fluid intake, or if you don't have all these tools, you can simply measure body weight every morning. Desaturation is absolutely key. Obviously, when you go to 2,500, the first night you will have a large desaturation, but you expect that the athletes, they will resaturate progressively during the, 
acclimatization phase. So just monitor the saturation level at least in the morning, if possible, during the night in your athletes. You expect a progressive increase during the first week. Then you've got the infection risk. We talk about that. So probably you can speak with your medics about some supplementation. Some teams use glutamine. You can't use vitamin C. And uh, monitoring clothing. Moderate intensity is absolutely key. You know, uh, Malcolm was talking about uh, the training zone. During the first week, you have to do either only moderate intensity below the first threshold or sprint or explosive exercise. No interval training, no training in the heavy zone or in the severe zone. Then recovery, sleep quality, different way. You can use questionnaire. In my case, we use questionnaire. For example, the DALDA is pretty good. Fatigue, you can use RPA during the session or and use heart rate variability. And then the ventilatory acclimatization, a key parameter is the breathing frequency. If you are a good responder in terms of your chemosensibility, then you will have a large increase in your ventilation. You can monitor the breathing frequency. Now you have some application like uh, Sunto or, or Garmin that will extract the breathing frequency from your RR interval spectrogram. And a key point, no antioxidant. If not, you will blunt the ventilatory acclimatization during the first week. You have refractometer for urine-specific gravity, you have oximeter, and you have bioimpedance, for example. I want to show you a study we did with the French uh, Nordic ski team. We had three groups. One group slept in altitude at 2,700 and trained at 1,100. And this group, every morning, the training was adapted based on heart rate variability. Another group did leave high train low, but then follow the program from the coach, no adaptation. And the third group was a control. What do we observe? Taking into account, sorry, taking into account some uh, feeling of the athletes. You can see that the group who slept in altitude, the group H, they have a large increase in this score, that's a French uh, Society of Sports Medicine score about overtraining. So they felt more tired. If you use the anxiety, they felt more anxious during the two weeks of training. That's a classic response to altitude in many athletes. It's an additional stress, an additional stimulus. But you can also see that the group who was HRV guided, they maintain the level of anxiety and the, the level of fatigue to the, to the same level than the control group. Then, using heart rate variability, we have also uh, a different response. The hypoxic group increased the heart rate in the morning and increased the low frequency, while the group that was HRV guided maintained these HRV responses to the same level than the control group. And in terms of performance, you can see that the two groups who slept in altitude improved their performance three, three weeks after, but not to the same extent. So what can we say from this study? And uh, it's just been uh, accepted in European Journal. When you monitor the heart rate variability in your athletes, you can slightly modify the training content to make sure the athletes train at a low intensity. If they train at a low intensity or if they don't, overtrain during the altitude, and again, the acclimatization phase is key, then you have a chance to minimize the risk of overreaching post-altitude. So the different methods. Just we summarize, a lot of different possibilities in your toolbox. I put in green all the ones I believe are useful in some way for triathletes. Most of you use leave high, train high, three weeks in Samoritz, leave high, train low, using hypoxic tent, hypoxic chambers, the combination of, of the two. And I want to present a new training method that is called repeated spring training in hypoxia. Repeated spring training on hypoxia, it is spring flat out, and it is in hypoxia, okay? So it is based on the fact that you will have high intensity exercise, inducing a high fast twitch fiber recruitment, and in the same times, high altitude inducing a large desaturation and deoxygenation. It is a method I did develop in my lab. So for all of this method, you have to investigate what are the mechanisms? Is it only 
the hematological response versus the non-hematological factors, which method I will use, and for each method, not only guessing what will be the ideal hypoxic dose, altitude level and duration, but also very important, what are the change in my training content and especially in my training intensity. For Wu, so if you are a coach of a developmental, developmental team, it's not exactly the same periodization that the top, top guns. And when, a very important question, the periodization. My option is that you have all the possibilities on the table, then you won't use exactly the same method during the base training, during the pre-competitive training, just before the Olympics. You have to play with the different training methods. Coming back to this method, repeated spring training in hypoxia, you know, it is here, leave low train high, RSH. If you remember that it takes 100 hours of altitude exposure to induce 1% increase of hemoglobin mass, for sure, the adaptation by using 30 minute session flat out of repeated sprint in altitude are, have nothing to do with the hematological change. It has to do with peripheral adaptation in the muscle. The idea that it is of important to be able to repeat high intensity action, including in triathlon, I've been looking to the literature, but you know that much better than I. That's the power profile in, on the World Cup in cycling. In cycling, it's not constant at all on the World Cup level. And including in running, you might, you might have the need to attack, attack again, and it's not, uh, let's say, uh, a constant velocity. So it is more and more important now in track and field, cycling, but also triathlon to have the ability to repeat high intensity actions, short bouts of flat out um, exercise during the race. So cycling, that's obvious, but also running. So we did a study, we took 50 guys, not elite. We trained them, 20 of them, they did repeated sprint at 3000 meter of simulated altitude. We had the group, they had exactly the same training at close to sea level, that's uh, Switzerland, 480 meter, and a control group who didn't do any repeated spring session. Very easy, it is, the session was three sets of five sprints of 10 seconds with 20 seconds recovery. Total duration of the session is 35 minutes. The total hypoxic exposure is four hours. So there's no change that you will change your blood content with four hours in hypoxia. In, in hypoxia. It, sorry, it is too short. Then the main results. When you do repeated sprint in normoxia, you know, you have the sprint, that's the average power output in white before the training intervention, eight session, and after. So you do repeated sprint, you increase your power output. It's a very classically described if you do repeated sprint, you improve your repeated sprint ability. But to, to the same level of exhaustion, it was exactly the same num number of sprint. It was nine sprint to go to 70% of the peak power output before. Then they did eight session of repeated sprint training in normoxia. Later on, they have nine sprint to get to the 70% of their peak power output. Very uh, classically described. Then the main difference with the repeated spring training in hypoxia is that before in white, they had nine sprint, but later on, they have improved the number of sprint to get to the same level of exhaustion. That means you don't improve to a larger extent than the normoxic training, your power output. You don't improve to a larger extent your glycolytic Capacity, you don't improve to a larger extent your VO2 max, you simply improve to a larger extent the capacity to repeat more sprint. So this type of uh, findings has been already translated in French tennis, in Welsh rugby. Uh, we've got now uh, some work to start with the NFL because it's obviously a direct interest in team sports to improve your repeated sprint ability. But my guess is that at least at the elite level, it is also somebody, something that is of interest for elite triathletes. You need to do leave high, train high, leave high, train low, and repeated spring, because it's completely different mechanisms. We did, all, we did also observe that uh, in terms of the transcriptional uh, responses, we took muscle biopsy. 
you've got some specific responses by using RSH. And the main reason might come from what's going on in the muscle. Here you have um, an indicator of the deoxygenation in the muscle. When I sprint, I will deoxygenate my muscle. And during the recovery, I will reoxygenate my muscle, OK? When I do my hypoxic training in hypoxia, uh, my repeated spring training in hypoxia, uh, that's uh, the black triangle before. And after the eight session, you can see you have a large increase in the amplitude of the total hemoglobin in the muscle. That is, you have more blood coming to the muscle during the sprint and large change in deoxygenation, reoxygenation during the sprint and the recovery. That is potentially of interest. So when I do repeated sprint in hypoxia, as you've seen, we improve repeated sprint ability. We've got transcriptional response specific adaptation that you don't get with low intensity exercise in hypoxia. You've got larger change in blood flow and oxygenation level in the muscle. And that's the key mechanisms. Because it is spring, you have a fast twitch fibers recruitment. And we know that when they are more perfused, fast twitch fibers are acting. And then you have the benefits of waste uh, metabolite uh, removal. OK? The question is, why it works with repeated spring training in hypoxia and it does not work with interval training in hypoxia. It means you have no additional benefits to do interval training. I've done a lot of study on that. If you do two minutes work interval, three minutes work interval in a hypoxic chamber, at the end of the training period, you get exactly the same performance enhancement that if you've done it in, a, in normoxia. So there is no additional benefits to do IHT interval training and hypoxia, while I'll just show you one data, there is some additional benefits with RSH. Then, obviously, uh, you have to convince the people, and the best way to convince people is to increase the level of evidence. So we run a meta-analysis, and you can see that this meta-analysis, you had a lot of studies, not just by, from my group, most of the studies were in favor of repeated spring training in hypoxia. You have a larger increase in mean power during repeated sprint session after RSH when compared to RSN in normoxia. The problem with uh, altitude is that there are many, many places you don't have altitude at all. And there are many people, they don't have any type of hypoxic facilities, mask system. So you can use hypoventilation at low lung volume. So here you can see that if I exhale and then break, keep my, um, hold my breath, but not a full uh, exhalation, I will induce some desaturation. That's, you know, the desaturation. What we've shown is that during a session of repeated sprint uh, cycling, during repeated sprint, Training in hypoxia by hypoventilation at low lung volume, you will have a large desaturation. You have it here. But at the muscle level, at least during the second set, you've got a large uh, change in deoxygenation, reoxygenation. That means that by using simply a different way of ventilation, you can induce some mechanisms at the muscle level that are close to the one I've, I did describe in an hypoxic chamber. And it is something of interest that is already used, for example, in rugby players. You can see you can maintain the intensity. You don't decrease your power output over the sprint, or you don't increase the velocity over the sprint, and you get the same benefit of improved repeated sprint training in hypoxia. I've been asked to discuss about uh, the differences of altitude training for male and female. There is basically no difference in terms of physiological response to altitude. And it is not affected by the menstrual cycle phase, uh, al the altitude-induced adaptation in the female. But as you know, women are more likely to be anemic. And they are more likely to be uh, iron deficient. That means you have to be even more prudent. New Zealand, they had, they had some recommendation at least six weeks before an altitude training camp, check the ferritin and then supplement your athletes 
if needed. And for the woman, there is quite a, an agreement that before and during altitude training, you need uh, systematic supplementation. Then, second take-home message is what's about altitude training? I think you you know now that I'm a strong believer that it works, but does not mean that uh, I would recommend altitude training too early. At least before the puberty, I don't see any benefit to use altitude training. No need prior puberty. Then start with the most simple method, terrestrial method, and go to the most sophisticated one later on. And altitude is interesting also as a coach because it's an education tool. When you go to altitude, you have to learn about the intensity, the hydration, and so on. So use that also for the side uh, beneficial effect. My final take home message for triathlon is keep in mind hypobaric hypoxia is not exactly the same that normal baric hypoxia. It's a more severe stimulus. That means you can play with both. I don't recommend to use one instead of the other one. Again, depend of the condition, depend of the fitness of the athletes, depend of the period. You have pro and cons of each condition. Obviously, the individual, the individual, the individualization, <laughs> sorry, uh, of uh, the altitude dose is much simpler in an hypoxic chamber than when you take your athletes to some rates. You don't have so much option. Triathlon is a very uh, strong sport that is strongly determined by aerobic capacity. That means you need some prolonged exposure to hypobaric hypoxia with different altitude, as I show for Fonremeu or Sierra Nevada. And you need now to combine leave high train low, leave high train lie with repeated spring training and hypoxia. And maybe, to be confirmed, it might be useful to use a ventilatory um, hypoventilation at low lung volume in addition to do continuous hypoxic training or repeated spring training in hypoxia. Got two books for the ones who speak French. Thanks for your attention and sorry for being too long. <laughs>